It's Friday night. It's the preview show. It's the No Name Never Podcast. Hello and welcome to the preview show brought to you by the No Name Never Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Bromley, but joining me as ever is the headliner of the preview show, the main man himself. Dave Statman Roberts. Dave, hello, welcome back. Hello, hello, Natalie. Hello, everyone, and uh, good to be back. So Very soon after back. the last preview show. So you? soon, <laughs> but we are back in our regular slot of Friday night preview show, aren't we? Because we've actually got a we weekend. We are. Video, so it does feel nice to be back in our regular, comfortable home for Friday night. It feels like there's some constant there. Um, we are, of course, here to preview the Clarets' next fixture following the terrible display at the Spurs game um, but a very good point against Leicester um, but before we get into the preview show and why we are here for we've got a quiz question that we need to give an answer to don't we Dave um, actually do you know what I'm going to pause it how rude of me Dave I forgot to even ask you how you were doing I'm, I'm so very sorry. well yes good uh, were you happy with the pre- I'm so sorry I was just blindly going on like let's do a preview show and, like a terrible horse that I am didn't even offer you a cup of tea Um How's the week been? Are the two contrasting games for, for Burnley with the Spurs debacle and the, the Leicester draw? I thought Leicester was a hugely improved performance, though, and this team doesn't half confuse me, Dave. Yeah, it was a disappointing um, performance and result against uh, Tottenham. A very good side, Tottenham, but um, Le- Leicester also a very good side and very good away from home. So, in the end, although we took the lead, um, there wasn't too much in it in the game. I think it was a Probably a fair result in the end. I know we've got the um, uh, main show, uh, the analysis show coming out as well, going into this in a lot more detail. But from what we can say briefly here, yes, a much better performance. I think most Burnley fans will be uh, much, much happier with the way that Burnley played on uh, on Wednesday night. And we'll hope that will continue on Saturday. Definitely. And of course, Fulham um, and West Brom both losing tonight as we record. What day, what day is it, Dave? It's Thursday, isn't it? We record on Thursday night. Thursday today, um, yes. That- Yes, so that and um, obviously, uh, so as you'll listen to this, listeners, given that West Brom and Fulham lost last night, um, <laughs> just also means that we've just managed to extend that gap to six points, which uh, isn't the 11 that we had after Palace, but does feel a little bit better, doesn't it? It means that there's got to be a three with goal difference, there's got to be a three win or a two win and a draw. They've got to get three results better than us, haven't they? Which always feels comfortable. So happy days. Um, Right, OK, moving on, now that I feel like I've been a proper hostess, um, let's let's look at the quiz answer. And at the end of the Leicester City preview show, we asked you, the listener, back in the 1982-83 season, Burnley lost 4-2 to Leicester City at Turf Moor. But can you name either of the two Burnley players who failed to convert penalties in that match? Dave, this was a stinger of a question. I don't think you're going to be very popular with our listeners here. Um, what were the two answers? Uh, well, it's going back a little bit further in time, yes, but the uh, answers were, and there were two players, and we said anyone who got one of these two we would accept as being correct. So the two correct answers were Brian Laws, who obviously went on later to become Burnley manager, and Paul McGee was the other player. And if you'll allow me to, I'm going to read a section from uh, Phil Bird's very good Burnley FC on this day book, which has got a section for this particular game, Saturday the 11th of December 1982. Uh, Leicester City won 4-2 at Turf Moor in one of the most bizarre games involving Burnley, as the Clarets used three different goalkeepers with two of them missing penalties at the other end. Brian Laws had already missed a penalty when goalkeeper Alan Stevenson was adjudged to have brought down Leicester's Gary Lineker. Referee George Tyson showed the red card to Stevenson. So in went goalkeeper number two, Paul McGee. Steve Linex converted the penalty to give Leicester a 2-1 lead. With the Clarets now behind, McGee came straight back out of goal and was replaced by goalkeeper number three. Brian Laws. The ten men fought hard and won another penalty. With regular taker Laws now in goal and having already missed one, McGee took on the responsibility and he too failed to convert. Alan Smith with two goals, Gary Lineker and Steve Linex's penalty were the scorers for the Foxes. Trevor Stephen and Steve Taylor scored for the Clarets. Excellent. What a look at that. It's like it's like book corner. 
on the previous show. Maybe that should well, be. It is, it is World Book Day today. It is. I'm very impressed, actually. It was World Book Day yesterday. Let's, let's uh, yes. When we're recording, it's World Book Day. <laughs> <laughs> let's stop trying to tell our listeners if this isn't live. Um, I like this. Maybe, maybe a feature for next season, Dave, will be extracts from opposition fan books or opposition players' autobiographies. No, we could do that, it. yeah. Yeah, not yeah, a bad idea, that. Um, did we get any correct answers to the quiz, please? Uh, we did. Correct answers we had from Adrian Caton, who also knew the answer to our previous quiz question in our uh, uh, previous preview show, but we forgot to mention him, uh, so apologies Uh-oh. for that. Uh, and also David Entwistle. Uh, they both knew that it was Brian Lords who missed one of the penalties, and coincidentally, they both guessed that Steve Taylor was the other penalty taker. But as we now know from uh, reading out the answer previously, it was, of course, Paul McGee, although D- Adrian Caden did come back later with a second guess and uh, and did say uh, Paul McGee for the second one. But I don't... Should we allow that or not? I'm not sure. I'm going to say yes. I think we allow him that. I think we can give him that. I'm feeling generous tonight. I feel like you're laughing at me. I can see on the video that you're laughing at me. I'm feeling generous tonight, Dave. I feel like I'm in a happy mood. I'm going to say, and especially as we forgot about him last week as well, I think I think we give Adrian Caton a bonus point there. He gets two points this week. Can Fair we enough, that? yes. Kind of thing? Yeah, excellent. Well, do stay tuned, listeners, because at the end of this week's show, Dave will be setting you another quiz question um, and you'll be able to submit your answers. So listen out for that. Opposition stats. Okay, so moving on to the actual preview show itself, Dave, which is, of course, why we're all here. We are, of course, looking at the Claret's next Premier League fixture, which is Arsenal at home, Saturday the 6th of March, 12.30 kickoff, live on BT Sport 1. So why don't you kick us off by telling us the recent history of this fixture? Yes, well, Arsenal have been the visitors to Turf Moor on six occasions since 2009, and they've yet to come away without at least a point, having taken all three in four of those recent games. Uh, All six of these meetings were Premier League games, and uh, they've had more than their share of controversial moments, uh, some of which we will mention later in the show. (laughs) Yeah, just one or two. Um, Although Arsenal have had the upper hand in recent meetings at Turf Moor, three of Arsenal's four wins were just by a single goal, and their only recent victory by a more convincing margin was a 3-1 win for them in the last match of the 2018-19 season, meaning the Gunners haven't been quite as dominant as some might think. Uh, The two drawn games in recent seasons were in December 2009, when an equaliser by Graham Alexander from the penalty spot earned the Clarets a point, and also the corresponding fixture from last season, which was a goalless draw in early February 2020. Good stuff. Of course it was Greza from a penalty spot. Where else would it be? Highlights and lowlights. Okay, what about highlights and lowlights, Dave? Why don't you start with the highlight for this? God, could you find a highlight for this fixture? It doesn't feel like it in recent memory, does it? Uh, yeah, I've got a highlight. We've had to go back a little bit further in time, though, with no wins in those Premier League games. Um, although Burnley won the reverse fixture at the Emirates early in this season, our last home uh, league win over Arsenal was way back in December 1973. But for our highlight for this episode, we selected a more recent victory from a cup tie. That game was in the Carling Cup in December 2008, which will be slightly more memorable for most of our listeners, I think. Uh, mm. Burnley had already got past Bury. Oldham, Fulham and Chelsea to reach the quarter-final stage of the 2008-09 League Cup. And the reward for that progress was a home tie against Arsene Wenger's Arsenal in the last eight in December 2008. Against the odds, Owen Coyle's Burnley, who were still a championship team, overcame their Premier League opponents thanks to a couple of well-taken goals, one in each half from young Scottish midfielder Kevin MacDonald, who'd come to Turf Moor from Dundee in the summer of 2008. It was a memorable night under the lights at Turf Moor and is well worthy of being a highlight for this episode. Absolutely. Capital punishment season. To, uh, yes, it was. It well. mm. And uh, yeah, the, the, the start of the, well, middle part of the cut run that I think got us promoted that like, that year because obviously we very, I think we've mentioned, did we mention in last year's preview show, the low light being the um, knockout in that particular capital punishment run at Spurs? 
I think we did, didn't we? Uh, probably we earlier this did. season, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, was it? Yeah, definitely. But anyway, uh, what about a low light then? Good grief! I imagine you had uh, quite a quite a pot to choose from in terms of low lights for this fixture. Uh, yeah, we've mentioned already, Burnley have suffered from more than our fair share of controversial incidents in matches against Arsenal. However, perhaps the most controversial of all of these was in injury time of the match at Turf Moor in October 2016. With two minutes of added time already played, Arsenal continued to attack, and after what can only be described as collective, collective amnesia regarding the offside and handball rules by referee Craig Pawson and his linesman, a goal in quotes, was credited yeah. to Lauren Koscielny and was allowed to stand. Uh, to refresh your memories, um, a cross uh, was headed across by Theo Walcott to Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, whose shot went in off Koscielny's forearm. Uh, this was apparently one of the key incidents which was cited when the Premier League made plans to introduce VAR. And this would surely have been a goal that would have been ruled out had VAR been in place back in 2016. Yeah, you say that, Dave, but given how the games against Arsenal go against us, I'm pretty sure even VAR would have found a way to disallow that from us. Um, listeners, this isn't great for you from a visual perspective, but Dave likes to decorate our show script with all sorts of clips and art and all sorts of stuff. Sometimes in nice our little Easter eggs like pictures of Sam Box for me, little presents, but sometimes it's just visual aids for the actual section. And he, he has got a, a picture of the, the the incident the offending incident with the arms raised and the ball clearly hitting the arm and it's uh, it's triggering me I'm not gonna lie fixture flashback um okay the first of our first of two um, new features for the second half of the season is the fixture flashback feature which is your chance to get involved on the preview show Dave take it away. Uh, yeah, each week we're asking you to send us your match day memories from a particular game from the past against our next opponents to be featured on the relevant preview show, preferably an audio recording, although we can also take written submissions and read them out. And for this episode, we're again, we don't know what we've got. It's going to be a surprise, isn't it? It is going to be a surprise. Um, yeah, listeners, we're not getting any, we're not getting enough memories here. Especially one when it's Arsenal. There's a whole array of, of incidents that you could have talked about here. Um, I was actually going to volunteer to, to give a feature fla- a fixture flashback. My God, Dave. A fixture flashback for this one. But I was literally going to choose that handball offside, whatever goal it was going to be. Um, so we've already, we've already had that in one section. But I think, um, yeah, get involved, guys. Send it through. Why don't you... Uh, why don't you just get involved? We want to have your we want to have your memories here. Um, Dave, tell our listeners how they can submit such memories, please. Uh, well, we we have had some really good ones through. We've had uh, ones through for the uh, last couple of games before this one. Uh, but for the next time we record a preview show, we're looking at our away match against Everton. Uh, so if you have any memories of past matches at Goodison Park against the Toffees, then please do get in touch to share them with us. Uh, you can get in touch with us in the usual way by dropping us an email, uh, podcast at net with either a written submission or an audio recording. And we've mentioned before, but the easiest website to use, if you're not comfortable using your own device to make a recording, uh, there is a website that can do it for you, provided you've got a, a built-in microphone on your phone or your laptop. Um, it's vocaroo.com, V-O-C-A-R-O-O.com. It's free to use, there's no registration, and it's really, really simple. Even I could use it. Oh, don't do don't yourself a disservice, Dave. <laughs> you are technically with you, and I, and I illustrate that, listeners, by saying that Dave and I have um, like a Zoom call for now for, for our recording. It's not going out yet visual. We might do next season, who knows? Um, but it's just, you know, it's, it's nice to have a face to talk to. And Dave has managed to do his wizardry. I don't know how you do this. But he's got he's got himself sat in Turf Moor. So I'm looking at him, talking to me. And it looks like he's at the ground. And it's a wonderful thing. So, you know, if Dave can do that, you can send us your fixture flashback. Um, and I can't help you the next fixture because, unbelievably, Dave, I have never been to Goodison Park. It's one ground I've never been to. Isn't that weird? It is, yeah. With it being so yeah. close as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, been to Liverpool, was never never done the Everton fixture, and I need to get I need to get a wriggle on now because it, they're moving. So I need I need to get that done. So um, yeah, I was kind of hoping that Burnley wouldn't get relegated this year because there's a couple of grounds that I need to tick off the old list. Pass lane this weekend. Not a vast amount of fond memories of that fixture. Usually refereeing interventions played a part. Rodriguez missing a sitter in the home game last season as well. So while I'm sure it's been touched on elsewhere. 
difficult to look past there. The 2 0 League Cup quarter final. Kevin McDonald, both goals. Really sad to read him about this week about him uh, struggling with uh, long term kidney disease. So nice to shine a bit of a highlight onto the uh, definitely the, the high point of his Burnley career. Two goals. Remember the second one, especially shrugged off a defender and just blasted it in. That was fantastic. It's the first time I've seen him win a quarter final. I think the only time I've seen him win a quarter final to date. So. Yeah, difficult to look past that game. Burnley 2, Arsenal, Lil, League Cup semi uh, quarter final. Let's hope for a, a repeat of that this weekend. Come on, you Claret. Heroes and villains. Um, okay, I'm moving on to my favourite section of the preview show, Dave. Heroes and villains. Who have you got as our hero? Uh, well, looking back at the history of this fixture, there aren't too many candidates for hero. And I know we've already mentioned the Carling Cup quarter final win from 2008 as our highlight this week. We've also selected the hero of that game as our hero for this week's episode. Uh, as we've mentioned already, it was a very memorable night at Turf Moor, and it was especially memorable for young midfielder Kevin McDonald, who scored both of the goals which took us through to a two-legged semi-final against Spurs. Uh, just to add at this point, all of us at Noni Never would also like to pass on our best wishes to Kevin McDonald, who's currently still a Premier League player with Fulham. Uh, it was in the news this week he's suffered with kidney problems ever since his time at Burnley, and these problems have now got to the stage where he's in need of a kidney transplant, which he's hoping to have in the next couple of months. So uh, best wishes to uh, to Kevin McDonald. Wow, my goodness, I'd not seen that headline, Dave. That's really sad news. Actually, on a similar vein as well, if you've seen in the news this week, our best wishes also go to ex-manager Steve Cottrell, who's really suffering with, with a COVID diagnosis. Um, we understand he's been in hospital for some time and has come out and had to go straight back in again. So, yeah, our best wishes go to speedy recovery to both of those. Please please look after yourselves, guys. Um where are we up to? I've lost my place on script. Villain. Yes, villain, please. Oh, my goodness. And uh, listeners, the, the, the visuals that I've got, the little pictures I've got for this one will make sense in a moment. But I, I, shall I just say, I'm looking at a picture of Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet saying, I'm flying, Jack. What on earth is that all about, Dave? Uh, well, yeah, who to choose for our villain this week? Uh, we mentioned earlier there have been some controversial moments in this fixture in recent seasons, and there are several prime candidates to be our villain. Uh, we could have chosen uh, Lauren Koscielny, uh, although not so much for scoring a goal with his arm, but for claiming in a post-match interview that he wasn't sure if the ball had hit his arm or not. Uh, spoiler, <laughs> it did. Um, or perhaps even, perhaps even uh, referee Craig Pawson, for not being able to spot that handball, although he didn't have the benefit of any video replay technology back then. Uh, but instead, we've chosen former Arsenal and Wales midfielder Aaron Ramsey. Uh, it was November 2017, and the incident was another late, late one in added time at the end of the game. The ball was played across and seemed to be well beyond Ramsey's reach. But feeling the slightest of touches in the back from James Tarkovsky, he flung out his arms like an extra from the war film Platoon, or maybe more like Kate Winslet, as Rose in the film Titanic. Either that, or there was a mystery sniper in the cricket field stand. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> the referee, Lee Mason, who else, fell for the theatrics, hook, line and sinker, and awarded an injury time penalty, which Alexis Sanchez converted. So from a very crowded field, Aaron Ramsey is our villain for this episode. Excellent. That's a good villain. Uh, finally, the day then, who is going to be taking control of the game at the weekend? Who's our referee? Uh, we've got Andre, Andre Mariner uh, from Birmingham. He's in charge of his second Burnley match of this season. Uh, his only other Burnley game in the middle so far this season was also at Turf Moor. Uh, that was the 1-0 defeat to Southampton back in September. Uh, however, our run of results with him in charge is not at all good. Burnley have lost all of the last six games in which Andre Mariner was the referee, all of which were in the Premier League, and this goes back over three years to February 2018, although five of those six games were away from Turf Moor. Um, he's also refereed two previous matches between Burnley and Arsenal. Uh, they were Burnley's 5-0 defeat at the Emirates in May 2018, which was Arsene Wenger's last ever home game in charge of the Gunners, and also Burnley's Carling Cup win over Arsenal at Turf Moor back in 2008, uh, which was our highlight. Uh, this was just one of four times Burnley have won from his 14 previous games in charge. Uh, there have been nine Burnley defeats and just one draw in the other games. Uh, finally, for this section, Anthony Taylor will be the video assistant referee for Saturday's match. 
excellent. Stat Man Dave's Stat of the Week. Now I know you don't want to leave it there, Dave, because I know you like to treat our listeners. So why don't you delve deep into the Stat Man Dave bank and let us have your miscellaneous Stat of the Week. Uh, yeah, for the Stat of the Week this week, we're talking doubles. Uh, Burnley have achieved a league double over Arsenal on four previous occasions. All of those were in the 1950s and the 1960s. The most recent Burnley double over Arsenal was in the 1962-63 season. But since then, Arsenal have performed the double over Burnley eight times, including in four of the six seasons the teams have played in the Premier League era. The fact that Burnley were 1-0 winners in this season's reverse fixture in North London back in December means that the prospect of a league double for the first time in 58 years remains a possibility, but only if Burnley can find a way to win on Saturday. If only. If only, Dave. Um, well, we obviously then have a look at this, Dave, and, and start to discuss how we think this week's game is going to go. But before we do that, uh, we have an opposition view. Our Dave this week spoke to Jason McKenna. Take it away, Dave. Opposition view. OK, this week, uh, for our opposition position view we're doing something a little bit different uh, we've got uh, uh, someone on Jason McKenna who you may have heard from before uh, Jason's an Arsenal fan he's recently been helping out the FPL community with his regular appearances for Premier Injuries with Ben Dinnery uh, if you don't know Premier Injuries has established itself as the go-to resource for injury related data pertaining to the English Premier League and they've got a database of every reported player injury since 2010. Uh, but they do now post regular updates on their dedicated YouTube channel uh, with loads of great insight for fantasy Premier League managers. So uh, welcome, Jason. It's good to be back. I love coming on the No Nay Never podcast. Uh, I feel like, um, you know, I'm a part semi-member of the family here. So, yeah, it's great to have uh, t- to be back here. And uh, thanks for having me on. And also thanks for the little promo of Premier Injuries. We're doing lots of bits there. And with your fans, I mean, the discussion that we had this week was actually what I think is the amazing work that Daesh has done in the circumstances of arguably Burnley having the worst injury record this season. Yeah, I mean, other teams have had uh, lots of problems as well. I mean, we played Crystal Palace recently and, and they had lots of problems, but um, other teams perhaps have deeper squads than Burnley have, so it's perhaps affected us more than most from, from that point of view. But yeah, certainly having access to the information, that's been uh, really useful to see. Not that it's helped my uh, fantasy team too much, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's not helped mine either. Don't worry, Dave. It's, <laughs> it, it's one of those seasons that is just... But because of COVID, because of so many elements, it's been hugely anomalous at times. I mean, this weekend, uh, in terms of predictions, I predicted you know Leeds to do well and other teams to kind of fall by the wayside. The data was pointing to it, form fixtures, and then all of a sudden, oh no, they're not going to go your way, and uh, captaincy failure for me, and things like that. But yeah, we're, we're looking forward to this Arsenal game, and of course, you guys got a great result against Leicester, didn't you? Uh, we got a good point. Well, we took the lead. Uh, that's a, a good sign from a Burnley perspective, and I think on the balance of the game, it was a. Uh, um, a, a fair result, I think, when you look at the, the chances. I mean, there's a chance at, at both ends. I think Schmeichel made some uh, good saves for, for Leicester, but equally they, they have their chances as well. So I think on, on the balance of it, I don't think either uh, side's too disappointed with the point. And it's another point towards the uh, towards the total. But we really got you here for uh, an opposition view. We want to find out about Arsenal. Um, do you want to start by telling us what you think of Arsenal's season to date? Yeah, Dave, it's... It's very mixed feelings that I would say on Arsenal to date this season. I tried to be hopeful because obviously it's a fairly newish manager. Um, Arteta obviously took over last December. And there has been moments of brilliance. There has been moments where I've been really happy. And I I do want to contextualise because it is a difficult job. There was a lot of change over. There's still that kind of hangover from Arsene Wenger that Man United's kind of seen with Ferguson all these years and now there's been a bit of stability with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and I don't think you can really put a price on that stability and I do believe that Arteta is the right guy at the moment so what I would say is we've got rid of some dead wood that we've needed to for a while no more so than maybe the wages of Ozil uh, on 
my opinions on the treatment of him are different. So I, I don't really want to refer to him as total Deadwood, but the fact that he wasn't being played for 350 grand a week kind of does help the club. I would say as well a huge positive is for the first time in a long time, Arsenal sit in the top four for goals conceded in the league as, as a positive there. You know, we're vying with top teams defensively. It's very strange. And sixth best for XG conceded. I'm extremely happy with that. Not as many goals uh, conceded, but also the data kind of underlying showing that it's correct kind of score lines. And then we have been continuing this development of good youngsters, Saka, Martinelli, um, and, and others have kind of come to the fore in the squad, no more so than Emil Smith-Rowe as well, who's kind of helped with those chance making. So hopefully we can build in the summer with a clearer tactical identity, but also build in terms of the squad and get some players in there that can really help us push a little bit further on. Because I feel there's a good core but there's just a few little elements that need to, to be added. But there are some other worries as well. You know, I'm a realist. I'm not going to say that everything is positive. A big shock for me has been the downturn in Aubameyang's output this season. He's not been himself. And it seems maybe at times that whilst defence has improved, we're having a bit of a cost to attack. We're bottom half of the table for many attacking metrics. Uh, big chance created, chances created. That kind of stuff is is extremely worrying. Uh, the loss of Martinelli, I can't. Uh, sorry, the loss of Martinez as goalkeeper. I mean, third best goalkeeper this season in terms of xG prevented. I think that was a silly sale. But then, realistically, would would he have been vying with Leno? Would they have both been happy with the situation? Maybe not. But I mean, my loyalty was with Martinez because he's been at the club. He'd fought for his chance, he'd proved himself and going into this season he was the better goalkeeper the data showed it, his form showed it and we won an FA Cup because of it. Uh, Willian I think was uh, a, a dreadful signing if I'm honest and what I knew at the start of the season was this is a very Arsenal thing is we kind of get a player early and kind of say, oh look, you know, we're going to have a fantastic summer. But nothing was built upon that. It was kind of an appeasement. And when it came to the summer, we didn't have that creative midfielder that we were dying for. And the fact that Ozil realistically wasn't in the squad anymore, we had that huge gap. That is why we have a creativity problem uh, linked to the Emil Smith Rowe point as well. I felt disappointed that we missed out on Uar uh, and the fact that, you know, uh, he, he's done really well this season like I said there he's a positive but he has to be managed carefully and so somebody like Uar who's world class could play alongside him or just give something different and although I really think Party is good I don't think he's world class in the money that we paid for him uh, and also I've been sad with the Saliba and Gabriel situation so uh, Gabriel injured for large stretches young fantastic centre-back and the emotional side for Saliba. So I think we'll be lucky to kind of get Europe this season as we were last year. Um, will that affect us getting players? I'm not sure. But looking at the teams above us, I don't feel we are better than many. W would you say that's a fair assessment there, Dave? Um, yeah, I think it's still a, a season of transition for Arsenal. And I think it's probably not going to be judged on what happens this year is building for something bigger for the future. Um, I mean, from from our perspective, I mean, we we don't really put that in our minds. It's a case of trying to get on and, and making the most of it, really. I mean, we did that. Uh, we got a victory down at the uh, the Emirates, and we'll be hoping to get uh, a double if we can uh, with a a good result on Saturday. Uh, with that in mind, what do you think Arsenal's likely starting eleven is going to be on Saturday? This is a, a good question because over the the last few game weeks, I've kind of been looking at this with eager eyes of, of seeing certain players play so with the work that I do at Premier Injuries I can say that the only injury concern is Emil Smith-Rowe they did a scan on him he still has some pain so I'm not sure if he will start this weekend so with this discussion this would be my best 11 that I would hope would play and and also kind of factoring in that th this is a difficult game I, I don't like it when people disrespect Burnley and maybe look at the uh, position in the league table because you guys are always really hard to play against 
And I think as well the the selection that I've gone with reflects the type of play that we would uh, anticipate in that game. I'm also unsure why Gabriel was not started in the last couple of games. There wasn't a huge injury worry, but maybe Arteta just preferred uh, Pablo Mari over him. So I'm I'm guessing, and uh, probably 99% right, Leno will be between the sticks. Tierney, because he's fit, he has to be there. Bellerin, and then those two centre-backs should realistically be Gabriel and Holding, but I wouldn't blame it, and I would totally understand if Pablo Mari's in there as well, because he, he, he has been doing a great job. But I just think that if Gabriel's the future of the club, then he should be starting. Uh, midfield, Xhaka has done a great job. Party should be in there because, again, no injury concerns and he maybe was rested a little bit. And then because of the concerns over Emil Smith-Rowe, I think the club will be conservative if they understand his injury history. So they'd bring in Martin Erdegaard, uh, which is actually fantastic that we did bring him on loan for this eventuality. And then up front, I would like to see a return to kind of Ober Lacazette. But William did play well the last game, and so did uh, Pepe. So, again, I wouldn't be surprised who was in there. It's, it's kind of quite difficult because at times this season, the 11 for Arsenal were, were really nailed on. But then at other times, it's been quite you know uh, transitional. Again, uh, I think this is the word that really kind of describes our season. And Arteta's kind of tried to go from one style to another, and I would like that 11, so hopefully we see it, but possibly not. OK, well, with that in mind, can you give us a quick score prediction? What do you think the uh, score is going to be on uh, on Saturday? So, again, uh, a difficult one looking at the context. We played well against Leicester last weekend. I was, frankly, shocked with the, the scoreline and, and actually kind of how easy it was to... To get the victory there, we, we played really, really well. And of course, I was happy with it, but also a little bit confused. But then I look at the fact that we struggled over some games uh, over the last six game weeks. So there was the Man United game where we didn't really create anything. We lost to Wolves. We lost to Aston Villa. The Leeds game, we obviously got the victory 4-2, but we did concede to. So it's been ebbing and flowing for a while. Then I looked at the data and we've been very poor in attack. We sit fourth from bottom for the table for XG on penalty over the last six and in the bottom half of the table for chances created and second for bottom for big chances created. So only uh, Crystal Palace have done worse than us. So I do usually worry about set pieces in these games with Burnley and Burnley, I think, are the second best for XG and XA for set pieces this season but Arsenal have improved a lot in this area so I'm actually going to chalk it down as possibly a 0-0 draw I think we will be lacking in attack Burnley are going to come out there and not want to lose I know that there's no home fans but it is still home it is still Turf Moor and I recognise that there is that psychology around Turf Moor that this is the fortress of Burnley so I'm going to say it will be a draw it might be 1-1 might be naught naught, but I don't see Arsenal getting the win there. Yeah, well, it was nil nil last season, so we'll see whether we uh, have a repeat of that or whether Burnley can perhaps go one better and get a double. It's going back a little while since we had a double against Arsenal, and maybe we're uh, we do one. So we'll see what happens. But uh, certainly, good luck after uh, after Saturday. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll see how it goes on Saturday afternoon. Yeah. So uh, talking about. Burnley, uh, I do have a soft spot for the team and this is why I love coming on the No Nay Never podcast. Um, and yeah, looking specifically at Turf Moor, what I would say is I feel bad sometimes discussing this topic because until last February, obviously, Burnley had not won against Arsenal at home or away since the 2008 League Cup. So I feel that many times that Arsenal have been lucky in these games uh the naught naught draw in february i think was a great example of the steely fight that i kind of expect in these games against burnley so looking through the years there what i would say is yes arsenal have won more often than not at turf Moor, but my memories coming between these two teams is an incredible fight and i love it you know i really look forward to these games because 
what that there is is Daesh kind of has his distinct style. He'll go toe to toe with most teams in the Premier League and not change because he knows that style. He knows how to play. So I won't say that there's a specific one because th- there's quite a few hard matches that have been fought. But what I will say is I'll, I'll always hold uh, a soft spot for Burnley in the sense that you guys gave a fantastic performance in Arsene Wenger's last game ever. And now I know that obviously that wasn't kind of t- uh, turf more, but his last game at home at Arsenal, you provided uh, a win for us there. But also... You, it was an entertaining game from half to half, uh, end to end. It was fantastic. So I have to be grateful as an Arsenal fan to Burnley for that experience there. So those are my memorable matches between Arsenal and Burnley, not just at Turf Moor, but at the Emirates as well. So, Boyd from a very good point midweek, Dave. How are we feeling about Arsenal at home? They're a bit of a hit miss side, aren't they? I'm, I'm fully thinking we can do the business on Saturday. I think we I think a point should be the minimum we're hoping for. How are you feeling? Um we know it's always tough with Arsenal, but they they know they're going to have a tough game when they come to play us. We've we've gone back over the previous results and uh, they other than the 3-1 win, they've uh, had very lucky wins and ones that have been helped by uh, late goals and one or two dodgy decisions as well. So um I think we can build on what we did earlier in the season. We obviously got a narrow win down there. Um, and we'll be hoping, yeah, to get a positive result on uh, on Saturday, and we'll never get a better chance to have a, a double over Arsenal after getting the uh, the first half in the winning the reverse fixture earlier in the season. Yeah, that's true. Be nice, wouldn't it? Can you imagine? Can you? It'd be such the weirdest season ever to have the season we've had and to actually do the double over Arsenal. It would just be it just be crazy things. Um, score prediction then, Dave. How do you think it's going to go? I'm going to go confident. I'm going to go for a one nil win. Two one nils, one nil down there, and a one nil on uh, on Saturday. Excellent! I love this. I am also going to go for a um, a, a win. I'm going to say two one to Burnley. So, listeners, let us know what you think the score prediction will be. Um, you can tweet us at known and ever, or you can email us at podcast at known and ever dot net. We want score, scorer, and type of goal, please. Head, left foot, right foot, bum, however you want to send it, but do send us your predictions. Fantasy Premier League update. Okay, Dave, moving into the second half of the show, and this is a point where we update our listeners on the Fantasy Premier League. And again, I'm going to send this over to you. Okay, but while we're on uh, Fantasy Premier League this uh, week, it made sense having uh, Jason on uh, with his expertise um, to try and give us some insight. So I'm going to see whether Jason's got any FPL tips for us. And in particular, I want to know, and I think maybe some of our managers do as well, uh, when's the best time to play any remaining bonus chips if you haven't already wasted them earlier in the season? FPL this season has been very hard, Dave. So uh, it's uh, it's a difficult question looking at it. You know, as uh, as I kind of said, um, I think off air to you that this season has been so difficult kind of predicting things and throwing numbers back and forth between us. It, it, it's hard. So what I would say with the, the chip question is it's really contextualised with where your team is and what it looks like. So with the bench boost, just to explain how that works, with with any of these chips, with wildcard, whatever, you can only play one one game week. So you couldn't kind of play free hit and bench boost so that you've got a fantastic bench for a free hit game week. That's not going to work. So my kind of advice with bench boost is you can either go about it a few ways. You can kind of build up to a game week and move your team around. And there's a few websites that actually are really good at kind of what you would call templating your team up to certain game weeks. But then kind of bringing it back to the data that I work in, we're averaging about 15 to 20 injuries per game week at the moment, which is horrendous, you know, and and this is the, the uniqueness of this season. I, for example, brought in Harvey Barnes, thinking he's in fantastic form, good data, and then what has he gone and done? He's got injured for about four to six weeks. So that kind of a tactic, I think, is, is quite dangerous. So the flip side to bench boost is... You find a game week and you play your best 11 and then you look at your bench and you think, well, 
that bench could do well as well. Just play it because it, it's kind of difficult to, as I said there, go with a prediction game week. So you're kind of happening to, to maybe bring in a few signings here and there, but I, I wouldn't change your whole team just for fitting to one game week. Now, the, the other thing with the bench boost is to maybe try and find a game week with a double uh, and a team or two, or maybe three that might be playing a double and so that you load up on their assets. But with all these kind of discussions there with moving players in, moving players out, I think one of the problems with FPL this game week were teams have kind of brought in a lot of players for this double game week. It's fantastic, there's a double game week. But then looking forward, do I realistically want to keep some of those players in my team? So a lot of people have maybe doubled or trebled up on Manchester United assets. But Manchester United, over the next six game weeks, have the worst run of fixtures. And they haven't been great at keeping clean sheets this season. So Luke Shaw might look good on paper because he's got two this game week. But is he good going forward? So that is uh, one question there. So with the triple captaincy chip, now I think the, the psychological thing with the triple captain is a lot of people think that, oh... This is make or break for your season. But when you look at it realistically, it's not a huge, huge chunk of, of your season tied up into that. It, it can possibly bring you into the upper echelons. But realistically, it's not that huge of an increase on your double each game week. It, it's you know 1.5 times the, the normal stuff that you, you're kind of going. So... Um, my recommendations with the triple captain, again, it's about your team. I would go for a double game week because there's double the chance of bang for your buck. But it's it's all about fixtures and who is playing well in those moments. So, for example, maybe a good one might have been Salah with uh, Sheffield United or, or even this game week. A lot of people kind of put it on, well, not a lot of people, some people put it on Gareth Bale. It's kind of just finding those incidents of where fixtures line up with form and you just kind of roll with it. So it's really how your team is. But I would definitely aim for a double game week because then you don't have the heartache of, oh gosh, you know, he's he's blanked. He's not played this game week and now I've totally missed out on the captaincy chip, uh, which we've kind of seen with Leroy Sane or, or other players in the past and, and caused absolute heartache. Free hit. Um, now, this one is a personal choice. Again, the, these are all down to the situations in your teams. But I think quite a few people used the free hit in uh, the previous kind of blank game week. But my team was strong enough that I actually didn't play it in that game week. So game week 29, where we see a lot of teams blanking, is my choice for that one. So just to talk you through game week 29, there's actually only four fixtures confirmed. Fulham versus Leeds, Brighton versus Newcastle, West Ham, Arsenal and Villa versus Spurs. So the, the sensible thing there is just to play the free hit because then you've got players for, from teams that are actually playing. You can kind of load up on the fixtures that you really like there and going into it. And, and the good thing about the free hit is as well, it's just for one week. So if a player gets injured like my Harvey Barnes this week, he'll be chucked out, thank goodness. Whereas normally with the FPL kind of punts and things, you you kind of have to live with the regret for a few game weeks at the very least. So you can kind of go punty on the free hit. But I think this season, game week 29, uh, is so limited that you might have to almost bring in some players that you might not like, but have fun with it. I think it's it's one of the my favourite chip probably because you, you can really go almost a little bit wild with it. But talking of wild, we also do have to talk about wild cards. So, Dave, have have you played your wild card? Did have you played? I haven't it? So, yet. No. So, I like to keep my wild card for as long as possible at the end of the season just because it gives you that extra impetus towards the end. And you can kind of factor in teams who have things to play for. So again, looking at the data, um, teams who have something to play for in the last few game weeks of a season 
generally score more and concede less, whereas teams that don't have much to play for concede more and score less. So you can kind of align your team with a team that is in form, that has something to play for and has the the cheap assets to get in. And if they're playing teams that have not much to play for or are already relegated or something like that, even better. So that's the the kind of recommendation that I give there with the wild card. But there's also the the thing, and I will repeat it again because it is the context of your team. If you've got a load of injuries, pull that wild card because not having a starting eleven is probably one of the worst things that you can have in fantasy Premier League. Even just picking up two one point from people starting is better than none. So the wild card is there as a precautionary backup for it if you're riddled with injuries. But there is that fun element as well towards the end of the season to get that final charge towards game week 38 and finish the season on a high. That's how I like to play. But again, it depends how adverse or how much you'd like to have a risk. Uh, Is that the kind of way that you'd play, Dave? Uh, that's some really good advice because I think I'm always really nervous to use them. I think I get to the point where oh, I'm going to use this chip this week. It's like, oh, no, I'll keep it till later. I'll keep it till later. <laughs> it's interesting what you say about using the wild card late on, which I think is a, 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 perhaps a good tactic to use. But I think some really good things in there. I think I, I, I don't necessarily, I, I've not been playing it long enough, I don't think, to try and get a, a proper grip on when the best time to play. So I think there's some, um, you, you can never say for certain that some really good advice there for our FPL managers, some of, the, of whom are doing really, really well in the league. Um, just while we're on FPL, the one thing we do go through each week, and we'll go through that now, you'd be interested to hear, um, we do have our opposition three to watch, which we'll be doing for the uh, second half of the season. And that's when we look at the three high scoring players in the fantasy Premier League for our next opponents. And for Arsenal, perhaps you'd not be surprised to hear uh, that Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, despite not being firing on all cylinders, is still Arsenal's highest playing uh, scoring player this season. He's got 96 points. Um, Burnt Leno has got 94 points in second place. And uh, Bukayo Saka has got 92 points. Uh, Leno, interestingly, was the only one of the three to play on Sunday in the 3-1 win over Leicester City. He was certainly the only one to start. Um, Saka was left on the bench. And Aubameyang only came on as a sub for the last seven minutes. So we'll have to wait and see who gets the nod for their starting eleven for Saturday. Um, in terms of the Premier League, by the time we record our next preview show, we'll certainly be able to bring you an update of the top of the No Near Never Fancy Premier League table again. And we should also be able to bring you details of the top scoring players for Game Week 26, as well as for Game Week 27. Well, I wish everybody good luck with their teams. And I hope that my advice helps a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm giving you guys all my luck because I've not had it too much this season as well. But I'm just looking forward to this 12.30 fixture on Saturday. It's going to be a great one. Dave and I will be messaging. Anybody who is listening can message me as well for a bit of banter towards this weekend's game and beyond as well. I'm always looking forward to footballing chats with everybody. But just a huge thanks for having me on again, Dave. And I'm looking forward to my next appearance. I don't know if I'll get like some special shirt or something because uh, I've had, you know, so many appearances. Might even have a testimonial. <laughs> Yeah, maybe not quite, but we'll certainly be happy if we're playing Arsenal that season. That's that's next season. That's going to be uh, certainly our aim. But I think we'll uh, we'll get there. I don't think we'll have a, a problem with that touch wood. But uh, yeah, thanks for your uh, in- involvement and input again, Jason. And we look forward to hearing from you again next season. Thanks, Dave. Excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. I love it. I love the fantasy Premier League stuff that we're doing. Um, Keep it up. Keep it up, managers. We're getting to the business end. I'm, I'm really excited to see who wins the, the second season. Um, we can send you a prize, um, which is not just a non and ever sticker. Statman Dave's quiz question. Dave, let's, let's round off this week's show then with uh, the quiz question, please. What have you set our listeners this week? Okay, this week's quiz question is, uh, prior to this weekend, only two Burnley players have scored against Arsenal in the six Premier League games between the two teams at Turf Moor since 2009. One was Graham Alexander, but who was the other? Mm, that's a good question. How do our listeners submit their answers, Dave? 
Uh, well, yeah, please get in touch with your guests using any of these methods. You can tweet us or send us a direct message, preferably on Twitter, so no one sees your answer. Uh, that's at never on Twitter. Uh, email us, podcast at knownerever.net, or you can also reply to the post for this preview show on either the Known Never Facebook page or on YouTube, where these podcasts go now as well. Excellent. Uh, good stuff. Okay, finally, Dave, have we got any... Um... Community business, please, to update our listeners. Fix the changes. Anything that we need to announce? Uh, well, one or two things to uh, mention. Yeah, first of all, in terms of uh, this season, as we know, it's been a season like no other for all football fans. Uh, but it was announced earlier this week that Burnley Football Club is once again asking supporters for their views in their annual survey. Um, so if you want to give your feedback to the club, positive or negative, um, they'll be glad to hear from you. Uh, the link to do that is uh, go dot burnleyfc.com forward slash survey all in lowercase and we'll also include that link in the announcements and the show notes for this episode excellent um anything else anything else coming up that we need to warn people about we've got uh, yeah just a uh, we, well, we have. It's very odd because we we've got this game coming up against Arsenal. We've got Everton the following Saturday. That's now moved back to the Saturday, and then yeah. bizarrely, after all the games we've had, we've got a, a three week gap. We would normally have had a two week gap anyway because of the internationals, but because the Leicester game uh, was brought forward because they play in the FA Cup that following weekend on the twenty first around that weekend, uh, we've got a three week gap. So we've played all these games. All coming thick and fast. Then we've got a three-week gap. And then after that, the games are fairly steady. We've got four weekend games. We don't know yet which day they're going to be all on because they've not announced the uh, kickoff times and the dates. Then, But the, effectively, we've got a game this Saturday, a game next Saturday, three weeks off, and then four more Saturdays. So it's a, going to be a little bit less hectic, certainly in terms of um, uh, podcast recording, but also for the uh, manager and the players as well. I think they'll be uh, a little bit relieved by uh, by all of that. Yeah, definitely. And having a three-week gap is going to be a, a, an exceptional time to uh, to ha- get some injuries back. Um, so what are we going to do to, to fill our time in when there's all these gaps then, Dave? Uh, well, what we like to do, as well as our regular analysis and preview shows here at Known and Never, is to bring you a one-off podcast as well. Um, it is just over a year, I think we tweeted it out earlier in the week, uh, since we brought you an interview with the one and only Ian Wright. Um, And later this month, during the international break, we have plans to bring you another one-off podcast special with another former Burnley player. But we'll have more information about that nearer to the time. Good stuff. That's exciting. And that's not something that uh, I'm involved in. I believe you're going to be making your hosting debut, aren't you, Dave? Uh, That's the plan, yes. Excellent. Well, tune in, listeners. This is going to be a fantastic episode. Whatever it may be, I'm a bit out of the loop. I'm feeling a little bit concerned. Uh, is this a coup d'etat? Am I being replaced? No. Is Statman Dave taking up? Okay, a few. <laughs> um, well, obviously, uh, we we'll look forward to hearing what you're going to get up to, Dave, and uh, it's going to be an exciting time. Um, that is all I think we have time for now. So my thanks go to the usual suspects, um, to Jason McKenna for his opposition view and his fantasy Premier League insight, both of which he recorded with Dave earlier on this week. So thank you very much to Jason. To Turf Moor Stadium announcer Dominic Walker for his specially recorded preview show announcements. To producer Matt for knitting all of this together and getting it out there. Particularly difficult this week because with recording schedules, we've had all sorts of different sound bites coming from everywhere and he's had to put it all together. So thank you, Matt. Um, But of course, to the main man himself, Dave, for just the phenomenal amount of hard work he puts into to getting this episode live and ready. Um, I know you always say you enjoy it, Dave, but it is still a hell of a lot of good work and hard work, um, just purely for the entertainment of our listeners, and it's, it's hugely appreciated. Um, our thanks, as ever, at the end of another busy week, go to you, the listeners, for sticking with us, for downloading and listening to this episode. We would not be here without you, and we very much love being part of your football routine. Um, We're reaching another milestone. We're now in March. We are getting towards the end of this pandemic that's keeping us all away from Turf Moor and away from our loved ones for as long as it has been. Um, The sun is shining, and life is starting to, to look brighter we get into the end of this but if any of our listeners are struggling and finding times difficult at the moment the lines at none and ever are always open we'll be more than happy to talk to you if you want to drop us a line tweet us or send us an email if you want to become a none and ever pen pal we tend to respond to emails so please do drop us a line with anything you want to have a chat about 
football or none. Uh, but in the meantime, do take care of yourselves. Uh, the analysis show will be back probably Tuesday um, with um, the thoughts after following the Arsenal game. And Dave and I will be back for another, probably won't well, be next Friday, won't it? Friday night preview show for that away trip to uh, Everton. Everton. Yes. I was about to say Southampton, but that's not right. Um, yeah. So in the meantime, keep an eye on social media and we will announce when the shows are coming up. I've been Natalie Bromley. This has been the preview show brought to you by the Non and Ever podcast. Until next time.